This is Beersmith episode number 119, and it's late January 2016. This week, Michael Fairbrother joins me from Moonlight Meadery to talk about making great meads with fruit. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, sometime this month, we're going to pass uh, 2.5 million total downloads for the Beersmith podcast to date. So uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's uh, way beyond anything I ever imagined. Uh, I want to say thanks again for listening. Uh, after some hard gl- hardware glitches on the last episode, I upgraded the video system to full HD. So uh, if everything goes well, this episode will be an HD video uh, for the first time on my YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash Beersmith, as well as on the blog at beersmith.com slash blog and uh, on iTunes. You can find the video version on iTunes as well. Uh, Thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazines. You get six amazing issues each year, packed with information for brewers and beer fans. They're offering a new discount code now, which gives you 15% off everything they sell, including subscriptions and training. The new code is BEERSMITH2015. I encourage you to check out this great new magazine for homebrewers at beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code BEERSMITH2016 to get your 15% discount today. And also Anvil, amazing kettles, burners, and accessories to help you forge the perfect beer. Anvil's a new line of brewing equipment for my friend John Blickman at Blickman Engineering. It's also endorsed by brewing author John Palmer. Anvil's a durable, reliable, quality line of brewing equipment that's built to last. Find out more about Anvil at anvilbrewing.com. Again, that's anvilbrewing.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Michael Fairbrother, owner and founder of Moonlight Meadery. Michael is a nationally award-winning mead maker who started his own meadery in his garage in 2010 and now runs one of the largest meaderies in the Northeast. You can learn more about his meads at moonlightmeadery.com. Michael's been a guest uh, three times before, and I encourage you to Google Beersmith Fairbrother and you'll find uh, three great episodes on how to make mead at home. Uh, Michael, it's great to have you back on the show. My pleasure to be back, Brad. Thank you. You're my first guest in full HD, so we're very excited about that. <laughs> I don't know if the world's ready for me in HD, but that's great. <laughs> you look good today, man. So uh, how are things going at Moonlight Meadery? We've had our uh, most profitable year in our corporate history uh, this past year, and uh, sales are, you know, five-year rolling average, 77% growth rate. So we're, we're doing pretty good. 77% growth this year. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, we're taking it with a bit of stride, but working hard to keep up. And I want to uh, want to mention your website, uh, moonlightmeadery.com. I just brought it up for those watching the video uh, thing there. Yeah, and we can ship now to uh, over 34 states, I think, online now. So our uh, online marketplace has gotten a lot bigger, and we offer uh, meat of the month or different clubs now that people can join into if they like. That's awesome. And uh, you can always drop by for a tour, right? Yeah, we're open uh, now six days a week, uh, Monday through Saturdays, uh, for tours and tastings every half hour. And uh, location again? Uh, we're in Londonderry, New Hampshire, which is about an hour north of Boston. And there's a website again, so moonlightmeadery.com. Uh, well, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, making mead with fruit. And uh, in the in the previous appearances, we talked quite a bit about the basics of making mead. So anybody that uh, is interested in making mead, I encourage you to go back and, and check out those episodes. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about making mead with fruit? Sure. So we make a lot of meads. I make over 70 different types. Um so fruit adds a lot of complexity to the to the mead base. So it really, you're looking for stuff that works um, with the honey flavor. Um, I usually look for some high acid level fruits like black currants or you know cranberries or something else that can add a tartness that balances that that honey uh, note that you're looking for. But you know, fruits really help your fermentations because it'll increase your uh, yeast assumable nitrogen, mm-hmm. which will give your meads a, a faster fermentation time and, and healthier uh, dynamics of the the process. And uh, what you know, what's really different about making mead with fruit instead of making traditional meads? Well, it changes everything. <laughs> you know, you change. You start from uh, traditional meads. You know, really showcasing the honey where your, your fruit meads can be really dry, more wine-like, or semi-sweet or sweet. Um, so you have a full uh, depth of range of characteristics, whether you want light fruit to accent the honey or dominate the fruit, um, and you really hide the honey in the background. 
Um, you can play with different types of honey and different types of fruit. Like we started with our fling, which is our strawberry rhubarb mead mm-hmm. with a, a wildflower honey. And it just didn't feel like it shined enough. So we ended up uh, swapping the honey out with orange blossom. And that little bit of citrus note that you get from a orange blossom honey really um, really helped make make fling what it is today. Awesome. Uh, well, melamel is the term we use to define uh, mead made with fruit. What are some of the subcategories of melamel? So you have sizer, which is apple and, and honey. You have piment, which is a grape and honey. Um, there are some other, you know, little more lesser known uh, categories, but those are the two primary ones that at least we focus on. Right. And um, uh, can you name some of the other categories real quick, just for folks that may not be familiar? <laughs> Oh, you're going to stump me off the oh, top I'm sorry. of the bat. No, that's okay. Um, I can think of all the methaglins and, and methaglins. Methaglins, there you go. Yeah. Well, that's a that's not a melamel, though. That's a no. uh, spice mead. And the BJCP is updated. So the Beer Judge Certification Program, their mead um, judge um, certification or style guidelines, has really broken up the, the category up a little more refined. So definitely if you haven't read the, uh, the BJCP.org, style guidelines on mead making, uh, mead styles, you should definitely take a look at that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They've got a a separate guide now. It used to be mixed in with the beers, but now it's kind of separate and uh, got it a lot more defined, a lot lot better now. BJCP.org again. Um, Well, obviously some fruits give a lot more flavor than others. Uh, What are some of your favorite favorite fruits to work with? Well, apples definitely work. So if you think about what works with honey, so apples and honey and cheese always really go together. Nice. I like currants. Currants are a um, really tart uh, fruit, whether it's a black currant or a red ter- currant. Uh, black currants are a lot tart, more tart than the red currants. Red currants tend to be a little softer, a little lighter profile. Um, raspberry works great with honey. Uh, cranberries. I've, I've done almost everything, and I'm never going to do watermelon. Um, I've been asked a few times to do a watermelon mead, and I've have a lot of people bringing me watermelon meads that tell me how great they are. And um, I'm sure, not, you can not, make a. You're not a fan of watermelon. I just can't visualize watermelon and honey working together. And if I can't think of the raw ingredients working, I don't want to try the the finished product and try to figure out how to make that. I I tell every customer, I said, look, you know, I make this stuff for me. <laughs> if you don't like it, that's okay. I get what I like. And um, it tends to work out well that way because then I know whether it's good to release or not, right? So if if I'm a fan, like we made a, a raspberry chipotle mead um, with a little bit of heat coming in the background from the chipotle and the raspberry, you know, and this was a winner of a competition I judged out in uh, midwinter uh, brew fest up in Wisconsin. And um, it's phenomenal. <laughs> it's really, really tasty. <laughs> But, you know, you got to think of how your flavor combinations work Does together. Go well with pizza, I guess? Uh, I like it on its own. Uh, we make a, <laughs> a methaglen that's really good with pizza. But, you know, Melamel's, we, we, you, know, you can get so many different varieties of flavors from the fruits, whether you're using like a pound per gallon, two pounds per gallon, three pounds per gallon, or even four pounds per gallon. And we make a blueberry mead where we're using four pounds of wild blueberries per gallon. And, you know, that's a lot of wasted space in the tank when you're finished. Because, you know, you lose that much uh, space um, per batch. You know, imagine 20 pounds sitting in a five-gallon carboy. It mm-hmm. takes up probably, pretty much your whole carboy, I think. Have you played uh, much with peach or apricots or pears? Uh, peaches work good. Uh, you can get a really, um, uh, how to put it, wild uh, flavor and aroma from peaches. So you want to be careful with, uh, like, the skins and... and um, Making sure any of the wild yeast that is on the uh, on the peach does not go into your meat and change the flavor profile. Um, apricots work okay, a little more tangy uh, fruit f- flavor wise. Uh, yeah, I've, tried- I've been I've been told that apricots actually taste more taste more like peaches at least when you make them in beer. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that in the the mead flavor profile. Um, you got to watch out for your acidity level. We have a uh, apricot mead that we're you know, actually going to take back out of the bottles and uh, adjust the pH, which I don't normally do. Um, but it's gotten, you know, over the last year or so, a little more acidic than I would have liked it to to stay at. And so we're gonna we're gonna change that up a little bit. But um, plums don't really. You got you're gonna need pectinase to to get it to drop out clear and not um, form proteins in the bottle. 
And um, so, what, what's pectinase? Can you tell folks? Uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, what's it for? I know it's, um, when you make jelly, they use pectinase to help really drop the clarity, so the jelly will set. Um, I don't know exactly what that does in the wine world. Per se, remember, I'm a home brewer gone pro, and I just pretend I know what I'm doing all the time. But, um, yeah, sometimes I wing it when people tell me pectinase will help drop the clarity. So it must bond to the proteins and the, uh, you know, or the pectins in the in the juice and get them to drop out of solution. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I know you work a lot with fruit-flavored combinations, too, and some fruits actually pair well together, right? Yeah, I, I tend to look at... Um, well, we, we, we do a lot of combo fruits, so like black currants, blueberries, black cherries, black currants, blueberries, black raspberries, uh, black currant, blueberry, black raspberry, and black cherry. Um, you know, I like the combination of the fruits because it adds more structure. Like the currants are giving you the tartness, the cherries giving you kind of a sweet tart finish, and the blueberries kind of like the the glue in between. So it's it's kind of like vanilla when you make a chocolate cake. So it's got a lot of uh, flavor structure that helps make the, the meads um work together yeah i know yeah. one of my favorites is uh you make one with uh black i think it's blackberries and currants or something like that right yeah we've got a few uh stiletto is a black currant apple um trying to think of all the combo fruits we have uh we do a cranberry apple um oh we did a black currant and rhubarb that was really tart that one might have been the one you liked uh that was called flame um, I haven't made that in a while. Uh, when I first made it, it was so tart that I thought my jaw was going to lock up. You know, the, just the, um, it, you know, it's just re- really tart fruits. And uh, we actually put that through a malolactic fermentation to uh, bring down that acidity level and change it up to be a little more balanced. Awesome. Well, uh, one, of, one of the things I want to ask you next is, uh, is, once you pick the fruit, you have to decide what to use, what kind of fruit to use. And there's fresh fruit, fruit juice, puree. Uh, what are some of the advantages of working with each of those? Well, the, the fresh fruit, you're going to get your best flavor. You're going to uh, clearly get, if you're picking a fruit from your own um, vegetable or fruit farm or, you know, picking your own fruit is going to get you the best. Second best, you're going to be buying it from a local store. And then third would be frozen. And then, you know, another step down the list would be concentrate and, you know, um, to go from there. Now, from a practical perspective, you know, or actually you can use fruit juice too. Like, um, I used a lot when I was a home brewer, the, uh, just juice products, like just juice, black currant or cherry. Um, that's a really great way to get, you know, really good quality currant juice to make your meads and to see how you might want to try to make a small batch because the juices are sold in a quart, um, jar and it's about a $7 per jar uh, price point so it's it's not cheap but when you look at your honey and in your products you you want to you're spending a lot of money anyway when you're making mead you might as well buy the best you can buy uh, they don't allow currants to be sold here or grown here in new hampshire um mostly because the plants host a blight that'll kill the white pine trees and that's our state tree new hampshire being the most forested state in the country per per acre um they really like the trees here for it is reason. beautiful up there i know that um, well, uh, the other thing I want to ask you, are there any extra steps you take when working with fresh fruit? Uh, do you clean it? Do you peel it? Do you pre-cook it? Do you pasteurize it? All I know both. some people like to freeze, <laughs> freeze fruits to break down the cells. So, what are, what are some of the techniques you, you use? So a couple things, um, if I'm using like a berry, like a raspberry, strawberry, or blueberry, I'm going to freeze the fruit first, um, to break down those cells. Normally, it's because we want to collect a lot of fruit, um, and it's easier to store it frozen than trying to figure out, okay, I've got two quarts of raspberries this week, got two more quarts next week, and two more quarts a week after that, and how do you then time your additions? Um, and freezing, it does help break down the cells so that you get a, um, a you know, you can really control your product. Uh, we don't, you know, sulfite or sorbate any kind of fruits that come into our shop. Um, we're basically buying them for uh, Usually the blueberries we buy in bulk. Uh, we buy like two or 3,000 pounds at a time, and they come frozen in 50-pound uh, blocks. And there's twigs and there's branches and there's you know, all sorts of stuff that you might find. And you know, they're not seconds, but they're, they're basically you know, bulk-packaged uh, blueberries that haven't really been picked over. So 
you know, it all goes in. <laughs> it's all a... Um, so you throw the branches and the leaves and everything in there? Yeah, we, we tend not to worry about it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, again, you, you're racking the meat off of this um, fruit base anyway. You know, the, the, the volume of noise, if you will, the sticks and leaves and whatnot, is so small in comparison to the amount of blueberries that go into it. Um, and same thing with our apples. You know, the apples are crushed pressed the day they're pressed they're brought to the meadery we use that to dilute the honey and usually we're running about 34 bricks um after blending the honey and uh, juice together you know we tell people normally about a 25 75 percent split so 75 percent juice 25 percent honey that's that's the average you know it can go up and down depending on you know a few different factors like how fast we're pumping the honey into the mixing tank versus how fast we're pumping the juice into the tank um, we have a really big pump that can pump 110 gallons of juice per minute, not per minute, per per hour. No, mm-hmm. it is per minute. It's it's a ton of juice. I mean, it, we can do 3,000, 4,000 gallons in an hour. So, you know, that's that's an awful lot of volume moving really quickly. Um, that's for your apple juice, right? Yeah, we it gets delivered in tanker trailer trucks to us at this point. Awesome. Um, what other things do you do? Do you, do you clean? Do you pre-cook? Do you pasteurize? So with peaches, definitely want to clean them. Um, probably want to uh, parboil them to get the skins off. Um, I made a mead one time back as a home brewer that I just kind of, you know, got some fresh peaches, you know, from a local orchard, cut them in half, took the pits out, and just put the fruit in, you know, diced it up a little bit and put it in. And boy, this mead came out smelling nasty as anything I've ever made before. And it was the, uh, you know, some sort of um, microflora that was on the skins of the peaches Mm -hmm. that really changed the aroma and flavor of the mead to the point where you could open a bottle of this across the room and I could smell it. (laughs) And I was like, wow, okay, I don't want to do that again. Um, (laughs) That's not uh, good. No, no, it it was a very um, earthy, uh, musky uh, type of note that really uh, did not shine if you would, that was about 10 years ago. And I still remember it like it was yesterday. So for an average home brewer, uh, what kinds of things would you recommend doing? Uh, let's say you want to brew with, well, you mentioned berries, you're going to freeze them, right? Yeah. So any of your berries really quick and easy, get them in, put them on a cookie sheet, freeze them up solid, put them into a bag and store them to whenever you want to make mead with it. And then just as you, once you've got your yeast going with your, your, um, uh, into your must, then you can add your fruit, we always uh, add fruit. Well, there's two choices. You can mm-hmm. add fruit before fermentation or, you know, pre-fermentation or for secondary fermentation. Um, adding it after fermentation really changes your flavor profile. So it'll give you a lot more fruitier um, notes, almost like a jam. Um, so you get a real uh, strong uh, fruity note to it. Whereas if you add it up front in primary, you get a lot more integrated flavors and tends to be a little more refined. I kind of try to describe it in the most general way of thinking of if you make meatloaf and you cook ketchup on the top versus you squirt ketchup on the plate afterward. You know, if you use ketchup on the plate afterward, you get a really fresh you know, ketchup flavor. And if you cook it on the top of the meatloaf, you get a much you know, more integrated flavor. So, I mean, you, you, you do both though, right? You use it both in primary fermentation and then you also will often add it in the secondary, right? Yeah, we've been tinkering around with a little bit more of the secondary ads, specifically to some of our meads like Fling, where we want that really fresh strawberry to pop right up. Um, and we've got accounts like down in Savannah, Savannah Bee Company, for example, just selling you know gallons and gallons of this stuff every day. So <laughs> we don't want to upset anybody. We're trying to keep the flavor at the, the optimal um, where people like it. Now, I even heard of some people adding yeast uh, right before bottling. Now, obviously, you got to make sure the yeast is killed off at that. I'm sorry, adding fruit at just before bottling. And obviously, yeah. you got to worry about the yeast being killed off at that point. Is that something you've tried? Um, we don't try to do that because we're trying real hard not to get any kind of sparkling uh, carbonated meads from what we make. Um, we are playing around with a little bit of that with our ciders that we're making. Um but, you know, we're, those are carbonated, so it's a little different um, process of how to make, a, you know, 
you know, most of our meads are 14 to 16, 18% alcohol. So we're, mm-hmm. we're dealing with a lot of alcohol anyway that can control the, the, any kind of reactive fermentation. But we're also sterile filtering our meads at this point. So they go through a 0.45 micron um, filter. So not only crystal clear, but knock on wood, no yeast um, going through <laughs> the process. And I say knock on wood because it's been a learning curve for us as we've had to learn how to do clean in place processes on our on our filters with caustic chemicals and acids and um you know how does that all you know the three hundred and fifty dollars a cartridge how do you get your value out of uh, those cartridges and and make it success but that's nothing your homebrewer is going to have to worry about they could um look up your sulfite and sorbate uh, regimes like a camden tablet but i believe has the, the combination of what you'd want to um, stabilize your product but be extremely careful. If you're going to put a mead into a bottle, even if it's been in your basement for a year plus, and you rack it and then put it into bottles that are um, crown caps, you could create bottle bombs, and they could you know they could literally hurt you or kill you. So if you're going to do that, you know please make sure you know what you're doing. Highly recommend using corks because corks will always just pop out versus blowing a bottle out. Um, and just be surprised because product can sit there in a carboy for a long, long period of time, and it's just that agitation adds a little more oxygen into it, which starts off fermentation. And and if you were along making mead and you were just not keeping track of your nutrients and your additions, you know the pH will change over time, and as that pH adjusts, you could restart fermentation just from the pH changing. We've got a few test batches, you know, test five gallon batches that you know, we made more of a demo and not really trying to, to put through our regime of, of nutrients. And, you know, particularly one was a paramede. And, you know, it's started up two or three times over the last year just because, you know, we really kind of have it off to the side. And it was something we made just to, to see what the fruit was going to do. And um, you can notice a few things. One, your pH will change. And two, you might see your fruit darken up over a period of time. Like the pear juice started off really nice and light, and now it's like a dark, um, more like a brown ale uh, type of color. So there's some oxidation that has happened to the fruit to, to darken up like that. And I have seen a few home brewers talk about meads that they've made that went from like a pale straw to a dark brown. Well, that's usually a sign of oxidation in some form or matter. So, you know, that's not usually a good thing to happen. And, and and what's the major cause of oxidation when you're when you're making mead like that? When you you know as you're aging it, uh, well, if your airlock runs dry, <laughs> it's gonna be a problem. That'll uh, do it. Yeah. You know, so uh, five gallon airlocks, uh, you probably want to use vodka or something that's not going to evaporate um, so quickly as water might. Um, be caution of temperature changes where it might backflow in through your airlock and drain it out uh, into your batch of mead, which you really want to avoid at all costs. Um, otherwise not having, you know, a good active fermentation, some oxygen getting introduced, whether it's stirred up or somehow agitated afterward. If you're racking your mead, you know, certainly racking mead, you know, you want to be careful that you're not splashing it as you're doing that. Um, you know, commercially wise, you know, we've had a hard, you know, not a hard time. We don't get the oxygenation levels that you might typically see in a homebrew scale, but we're working at a, you know, much, much larger volume and we're um, using nitrogen as a blanket on top of uh, the, you know, on the top of the vats to keep the oxygen level away. But you, you could probably do the same thing with CO2 if you have a CO2 tank for kegging sure. or something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. That would work fine. Um, well, another big decision is how much fruit to add. Uh, for a few of your favorites, uh, how much uh, how much fruit do you add versus uh, honey for a given volume of mead? So, yeah, um, on, on a homebrew scale, obviously. Yeah, well, that's why I keep it ratios. It's so much easier because <laughs> you can scale <laughs> infinitely. Yeah, uh, the most we do is about four pounds per gallon. Uh, typical batches for us are about two to three pounds per gallon of fruits or the equivalent. So you can get a calculator that shows you, you know, if you're buying concentrate or juice, how much pounds per gallon is giving you that much bricks. And then you can calculate into your recipe, you know, how does it all fit together? So like when I was making uh, five gallon batches of what became desire, I'd go buy equal quantities of black currant juice, blueberry juice, and black cherry juice. And, Offset, so 75% of the batch was juice, 25% of the batch was honey, 
blend it all up, you got a really monster of a um, starting gravity, probably 34, 35, actually maybe about 38, 38 bricks. So that's huge. So um, that, yeah, that's one of my favorites, and it's two-thirds. Uh, so you're saying it's two-thirds fruit, right? Right. Well, there's some water that makes up the fruit juice, but, you know, it's most of it is, you know, the juice. And it's the the flavors that you can get from that, you know, isn't like anything else. I mean, if we were to use, let's say, you know, half that juice and offset it with water, you know, you would have such a lighter flavor that it wouldn't be able to hold up to, to the beverage. You know, so, I mean, we are making a new mead that's uh, called Stock Up. Um, that's a, you know, I was shooting for 6% and I hit 10. <laughs> so I'm not used to making uh, the very light meads. Um, so I just got <laughs> 10. How'd you, how'd you, how'd you overshoot by that much? Well, it was a, uh, uh, basically I was making it, um, uh, like I make everything in, yeah, I felt like it was too light. So I, I, I bumped the numbers a bit and then it all fermented out and, um, uh, as I sent it away to be tested, it came back at 10.35% alcohol. And I'm like, well, I guess I missed the uh, number. And with the feds, you have to. Just, if just by a little bit, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, when, when we're dealing with a making product, we have to declare if it's over 7%, we need to get a formulation approval. And so I had declared it to be like 6 and we didn't need the formula. So then I had to go back and get a formula to match what we actually made. So it's. As a home brewer, you got your choice. So the easiest way to think about it from home brewing, and most of your home brewers are probably using starting gravity and uh, finishing gravity, but if you use the brick scale, which is percent sugar, you know you can divide that percent sugar. You know, let's say you start with twenty bricks and you finish at um, two bricks, so you have eight bricks have consumed by the the, the yeast during the fermentation process. That's four percent alcohol. Yeah, so, so you divide the number by half. So if you start with 38 bricks and you come down to four bricks, you know you take that 34 bricks, divide it by half, and you have a 17% alcohol mead. I think I got all that right. That's a pretty strong mead, I would think, right? Yeah, that's why your fermentation uh, kinetics have to be spot on. So you want to have make sure that you know you're you're using nutrients. Um, uh, in the right way, calculating what your um, nitrogen levels are to start from. You know, like cherry juice has a lot more nitrogen in it than um, some of the other juices. So, so tell tell me about that. I'm not familiar with having to calculate out nitrogen content. So, yeast assumable nitrogen, Yan. Um, the whole point behind the staggered nutrients or the tailored staggered nutrient addition that which, uh, which I should mention we've covered a couple times in the previous podcast with you, so people can go back and look at that. But go ahead. So, yeah, so the, the nutrients, what you're trying to do is make sure your yeast is at its optimal level for fermentation. And yeast needs that nitrogen to have help, healthy fermentation and growth rate. So by understanding, you know, honey pretty much has zero. Um, and you can calculate what your um, total nitrogen per gram will be from whether it's Fermaid O, Fermaid K, DAP, or any of the other um, nutrients or nitrogen sources that a home mead maker might use, then you can kind of get a ballpark uh, for how you want to calculate that. And um, Sergio at Melovino has a, a website, and I can't remember the, the website off the top of my hand, but it's a uh, staggered nutrient, uh, tailored staggered nutrient addition. Uh, I believe him and some of the other home brewers down in New Jersey uh, came up with this uh, regime. And I don't even remember the acronym. It's like Tailored Staggered Nutrient Addition. So it's like TSOGNA, I think. Ah, I'm not sure. But um, it's, it's interesting enough. And I've, you know, I always recommend people go talk to Scott Labs or look at the Scott Labs um, materials on their website because it will give you all the details you need to understand about how much nutrients you're trying to add and then you know, why we're trying to do this. So another good resource is to you know, think about attending one of the UC Davis uh, mead-making courses. They have an advanced one coming up next month. Mm -hmm. um, they have an intro one that I've taught at, at the last couple of years. Um, but you know, it's, there's, there should be plenty of information out there. And if worst case, join the American Mead Makers uh, Association and that's uh, mead-makers.org. And, you know, professionals like myself, uh, Brad, um, Sergio, Ken, Mike Fall, 
um, are all on there and active and we happily answer questions you might have. Yeah, there. Uh, I'm going to pull it up real quick. This is the uh, should be the American Mead Maker site right there at uh, meadmakers.org. So, uh, so there's the there's the site. Um, well, I wanted to ask, go back for a minute and talk about uh, how you add the fruit into the into the process. Uh, you mentioned you can add it. Uh, do you add it when you pitch the yeast? Basically, is it the very beginning of the process when you're adding it uh, in the fermentation, for example? Well, for us, if we're using juice, we're putting it right into the mixer. Um, to blend the honey and juice together before we add the yeast. If we're using frozen fruit, um, due to our mixer and pumps involved, we're adding the frozen fruit right into the fermenter, and we pump the meat on top of that, uh, which makes it a little challenging to try to figure out how much uh, bricks you're going to get out of the fruit versus from mm -hmm. your uh, must. Um, yeah. And also, if you're using frozen fruit in the quantity we are talking about, like 2,000 pounds of frozen blueberries, your yeast is going to be pretty... Uh, pretty dormant uh, until the must gets warm enough where you can actually, you know, it can, you know, do its job. Roughly I mean, so about, you're, you're literally putting frozen fruit there. You don't even thought it then, huh? No. We, we, <laughs> yeah, we're, we, we're dumping the uh, 2,000 pounds, 50, block, 50 pound blocks at a time up over a 12 foot size tank, working our best not to collide into the uh, temperature probes that stick into the tank and breaking those off. Thankfully, knock on wood, we have never done that. Um, but as you can imagine, walking up and down a ladder with a 50-pound block of blueberries isn't the ideal way to, to do this, but you know, sometimes you're stuck. Doesn't sound like a lot of fun. No, and that's, that's the tip I was giving your, your uh, listeners and viewers to uh, know that if you freeze your fruit on a cookie sheet, freeze it first and then put it into a Ziploc bag, you're going to, you know, it won't be um, frozen into a big mass. It'll be um, pourable, so you could use a funnel to pour it into your carboy, for example. Awesome. Um, well, brew when brewing fruit beers, uh, one problem is the sweetness uh, and aroma often gets fermented away. Uh, in mead making, I understand you often use additives to kill off the yeast to retain some of the residual sweetness. How does, how does all that work? Well, that's not how we do it. <laughs> That's not we, how you do it, okay. No, we, we start with uh, more sugar or more honey and fruit. You know, Essentially, yeast can only ferment so far. So if right. you know your yeast can go to about 14%, 15%, and you make something that should ferment out to about 17 18%, you, you're pretty much guaranteeing you're getting uh, some sweetness in the finished product. So we try to really strive to, to hit that sweetness level up front uh, and let the yeast only ferment as far as it can, and then we still have our residual sweetness. The other option is to make a, a really sweet mead and you have maybe your fruit mead that comes out too dry. You can then back blend two different meads to make you know, the balance you're looking for. And how we do that here is we would you know, make a traditional mead, make it like 36 bricks, let it firm out, firm aid, ferment down to about 10 bricks, and then we would be able to have that 10 brick sweetness and you can create, um, oh, what's the heck's that triangle called? You can, you can, um, oh, I can't remember stupid names, but the, the, basically okay. there's a, a triangle that you can calculate what your blending ratios should be. If you want to hit, let's say you're starting with a 10 bricks on one and a one bricks on the other, you can calculate your ratios to get like a six bricks uh, or two bricks, uh, mead that you're looking for. And uh, how large a factor is choosing uh, your strain of honey to match the style or flavor of the fruit? Do you actually look at that or not? Most of the time we're using wildflower. Uh, occasionally we're using uh, orange blossom. All of my piments are orange blossom based. I think uh, the orange blossom is really nice and supportive of like fruits like grapes, uh, raspberries. Yeah. We did one with uh, heather blossom honey from northern Scotland. Uh, I can tell you that heather honey is a dominant uh, flavor profile that you want to be um, very light with on the, the, the ratios that you use. So we used 100% um, heather honey with some blackberries. And the blackberries were probably two or three pounds per gallon. And you really you can taste the blackberry and you can see it. But, boy, you just smell the, uh, the um, heather honey, which... You know how you can taste honey in food and honey tastes a particular flavor? Well, think of that flavor, then multiply it by 10. So, you know, it's such an earthy, uh, dominant mineral-type flavor. And what we found 
you know, in talking with like the National Honey Board and, and doing some research, the darker the honey, the less I personally like it in a fermented product because you have a higher ash content, a higher mineral content of that. And there's some polyphenols uh, that are higher in the darker based honeys that uh, I particularly don't like fermented through. So I try to look for almost water white or light amber um, colored meads or honeys to use in my product. Do you have any tips for working with uh, really light fruits? Uh, strawberry, for example, I know is very difficult to brew beer with. Um, do you have any tips for working with some of the lighter favorite, flavored fruits? Go big. Buy a lot of bl- strawberries. <laughs> also, the, the two things or several things you need to meet your viewers need to be aware of. Um, you need to punch a cap down. So the cap is called the fruit. So as a fruit sitting on the top of the must, it's going to create an insulation blanket where the CO2 – so Yeast is exothermic, which means that it generates heat during the fermentation process. Now, when you're dealing with beers or, you know, juice in particular in a must, you got nothing that's going to hold that or capture that heat level at the top of the um, the must. But when you're using like strawberries or blueberries or anything else that's going to float to the top, it's going to form an insulation blanket. And what's going to happen is your your temperature right underneath that um, layer of fruit is going to be hotter than um, – probably ambient so you may think okay my temperature of my house is about 68 perfect i got this uh, fermenting away and i'm going to have this nice clean mead and then when you're finished you're going to get a high fusel note and you're like what happened well it's cooked (laughs) so you want to keep punching that fruit down two or three times a day um, for the first few days that you've got the fermentation underway so that you can get that heat out from under you know, let the CO2 escape, let the heat escape out. And, you know, it, it really helps your fermentation um, to keep that clean flavor. Now, when we're dealing with 2,000 pounds of blueberries, trying to push that down at the top of a tank, you know, it's almost impossible. So what do we do is we pump the meat over the top of the fruit, you know, with a recirculation pump so that we can, you know, break the heat uh, level that's up there. Um, I know that fruits are also that are high in acidity, uh, you know, particularly citrix, uh, uh, create a problem as well. How do you deal with those? Well, um, one way to do that is when we make our a um, um, couple different ways. One, you know, if you're dealing with uh, like oranges or limes, like we make a mojito mead based on Mike Manning's uh, from Meridian Hives Meadery. Um, back when he was an amateur, you won a competition um, made a mojito mead. That, um, so it's mint and lime and orange blossom honey. Uh, so you get a beautiful citrusy note to it um, from the limes. And what we do is we add the juice, uh, the lime juice, after fermentation with some uh, lime zest to really kind of balance or use that citrus note to really kind of capture you know that the, that mojito uh, type flavor and with muddled uh, lime. Oh, sorry muddled mint, you know, you get that nice combination of a mint and lime. We also make uh, a mead based on uh, Jason Phelps' recipe, uh, which is called Summer Love, which is a orange and vanilla, another homemade mead that, you know, we did a ramp up with, and people love it, you know, so it's almost like a creamsicle. And again, you know, we use the orange zest, orange juice, and um, in that one, I believe we had the oranges in the fermenter, um, basically quartered them up, stuffed them right down inside the tank, we did notice a little bit of a pithy note to the, to the flavor, so we've kind of adjusted that that recipe a little bit with um, less, you know, fresh oranges and more of an orange juice and zest, you know, actually zest the oranges to get that clean orange uh, flavor that we want. Do you actually monitor the acidity and the pH of the finished product, or how do you handle that? Yeah, <laughs> we, we, we record everything. So we have um, batch logs that we record the pH and temperature and um, um, bricks as we ferment the batch so we can see how it's progressing. So we can actually plot out the, the, um, the characteristics of the fermentation. You know, our temperature here can vary pretty significantly from early spring through winter. You know, temperature of the metery gets pretty... Um, diverse which changes the challenges for us as we have a chiller but we don't have a heater on the tank so we can't quite control if it's getting too cold how to bring it down in temperature so during the winters for example we ferment a lot slower than we do in the spring and summer fall time frames here in new england 
And uh, do you have any tips for finishing your melomels? Uh, I, I think you mentioned that you filter now, right? Filtering is definitely a plus. The, the best thing a home brewers can do is age and rack. So think of raspberries. The raspberry seeds have um, a lot of tannins in them. So if you're going to make a raspberry mead, you might get an oak finished note in the product because it's leaching out those tannins from the, the, the raspberry seeds. Strawberry seeds, similar but a little different uh, type of flavor. So once you've gotten the flavor you want in the product, take it off the fruit. You know, um, and the other thing that's going to happen during fermentation is you're going to lose a lot of the aromatics from the fruit. That's why, like, Ken... Um, Shram likes to have, you know, his fruits, I believe, post fermentation going into his batches or into uh, secondary, so that he gets a really crisp, rich um, fruit aroma and flavor. Uh, well, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, regarding melomels? Go find some. We make a lot. Uh, we ship them now all across the country, uh, over to China, Japan, and uh, Australia now. Um, Support the meat industry. Join the American Meat Maker Association. There's uh, a lot of us who are really giving everything we have to uh, build this industry, build something that people can enjoy, whether it's with dinner, after dinner. Um, you know, we, we, we try to make something for every, every occasion. And finally, I want to ask you, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add regarding Moonlight Meatery, some of the new things maybe you've got coming out or uh, some of the new things uh, people can look for? So we got a, a brand new mead that we're going to be making this year. It's going to be based with blood oranges. Um, we're also going to be making a um, elderberry mead. Um, brought, got some samples of the fruit in the other day, and I blended it with a, a mead just to see what the flavor profiles are going to come out. Really looking forward to them. Um, we sell almost all of our meads now nationwide on draft. So if you've got a favorite uh, bar that doesn't have uh, one of our meads on draft, ask them for it. Uh, we have a list on our website of all our wholesalers. So, and, and feel free to contact me. Um, you know, trying to gauge all the questions now on how to start a meadery and such to the American Mead Makers Association site, so we can share that knowledge with with all the people looking to start meaderies. But um, Bernice and I, uh, Bernice, my wife, uh, are working on our book this year, so we're we're trying to get back at that. And um, oh, congratulations. Yeah, we're, we're making progress, which is, it's the first time I've been able to say that in three years. So I'm uh, very happy to uh, be working on that. Well, Michael, uh, thank you again for coming on the show. Brad, always my pleasure. And again, uh, my guest today was Michael Fairbrother, the CEO of Moonlight Meadery. You can find out more about all of his meads at moonlightmeadery.com. Thanks again, Michael. My pleasure. Take care. Well, thanks again to Michael Fairbrother for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, where you get your 15% discount on their magazine or anything in their store if you use the offer code BEERSMITH2016 when you shop at beerandbrewing.com. Again, use the offer code BEERSMITH2016 and get your subscription today at beerandbrewing.com. And also Anvil, new line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. Kettles, burners, and accessories that are built to last. Get durable, reliable, high-quality brewing equipment from Anvil at anvilbrewing.com. Again, that's anvilbrewing.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.